Okay, welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verses 51 and 52, which read as follows. Yatha pi ruchirang pupang vannavantang agandhakang evang subhasita vaja aphalahoti akubato Yathapi ruchirang pupang vannavantang sagandhakang evang subhasita vaja saphalahoti kubato almost the same they're actually a pair of verses and they go as they, the meaning is yathapi ruchirang pupang just like a beautiful flower vannavantang with uh, Vanavantang just means with beauty, endowed with color. Agandakang, but without a smell, without a scent, without a beautiful, without a perfume. Evang subhasita vaja, such are well spoken words, or so too well spoken words, appalahoti, do not bear fruit. Akubato for one who doesn't perform them. For one who doesn't, sorry, for one who doesn't act according to them. And then the second one, Yatapi, Ruchirang Pupang, Vannavantang, Satgandakang, just as a beautiful flower endowed with color and uh, Sagandakang with, with a beautiful perfume as well. Evang Subhasita Vaja, so too, or just so. Words that are well spoken do bear fruit for one who acts according to them. So a fairly uh, standard verse, the sort of thing you'd expect from the Buddha's teaching, which places so much emphasis on practice, on sincere appreciation and realization of the teachings as opposed to just intellectual appreciation or, or understanding. It's an interesting story that goes along with this verse. Interesting in that it, um, as, as with many of the stories, there's, no, there's not much explanation as to how the story relates. In this case, it's not even immediately clear why the story is told as it is in relation to the verse. And, but I'll, I'll explain it. I, I think I've, it, 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 I, can't, I, I can see where it's all coming from. It's quite interesting, actually. So it's, it's a short story. The story goes, and a little bit of background to the story is that in the Buddhist time, there was a tradition to take the eight precepts <coughs> for the Uposatha days, which um, would have been at the very least the Poya day, but seems to have potentially been a weekly thing, where on the eighth day and then the fifteenth day of the lunar cycle, so every, every lunar month has 30 days, 29 or 30 days. And so uh, the first, after eight days, the eighth day was the half moon. And then the 15th day would be the, uh, if I got it right, the full moon. And then the 22nd day, I got it right? No, 15th plus eight. 23rd day would be the uh, half moon again, and then the 29th or the 30th day would be the empty moon. So basically, 
you know, with a little bit of fudging there, it, it turns out to be 30 days. And so it was. It was. It would be standard for Kalyana, Kalyana Putujana, the, the people who were in, endowed with virtue and, and goodness, but not yet enlightened. It would be their habit to go to the uh, go to Jetavana or wherever the Buddha was staying or wherever the monks were staying and request the eight precepts just as we do now in Sri Lanka, they do on the Poya day, except they only tend to keep them till 5 p.m. It's not true. Some places, like Mitrigala or uh, Mahameona, I think they do the whole 24 hours. But the, 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 the background to this story is that uh, for enlightened people, enlightened beings, anagamis, Anagamis on up, they, it seems they would keep the eight precepts naturally. Uh, I'm not sure that's ubiqui ubiquitous, but it does seem, or whether that's uh, um, true for, for every anagami, but it seems to be, according to the commentary, true that, and it may be in the Tipitaka somewhere, that an anagami always keeps at least the eight precepts. I think there's even some idea being floated around there that they keep ten precepts. You know, you have the story of Gatakara, who he looked after his mother, but he didn't use money, it seems. He may not have used money. Anyway, the, the point is they have natural morality, so they don't go to, they don't go and request the precepts. They're always keeping them. And there was one lay disciple of the Buddha who was uh, an anagami, uh, he was in this category, but he would still go every every Uposata day to hear the Buddha's teaching. And here's where we get to the background story. He went to the Buddha's, he went to hear the Buddha's te teaching, and he paid respect to the Buddha, and then he sat down to one side, and then King Pasenadi came along, and he thought to himself, "Well, what do I do? Do I stand up for King Pasenadi, or and and?" Uh, and pay respect to him. If I don't, he'll get angry. But if I do, then I'll be disrespecting the Buddha because it, it was apparently a custom when you're in the presence of a higher uh, person, you, you would never never stand up to salute a lower person. And because he held the Buddha as higher than the Padesa Raja, the Buddha was the Raja, the Agaraja, the highest king, the king of the Dhamma. And uh, Pasenadi was just a Padesa Raja, which is the king of the country. So because he held the Buddha higher, he thought, well, I'll have to just sit still, even though I, I know Pasenadi is going to get angry, because King Pasenadi wasn't, uh, wasn't enlightened by any means. And Pasenadi saw this and saw his, one of his, his, uh, what do you call people, uh, under the king? Subjects, one of his subjects. Boy, my English is terrible. One of his subjects failing to stand up and salute him. And he got very angry. And the Buddha, of course, un un understanding what was going on in King Pasenadi's mind, he extolled the virtues of this, uh, this lay disciple. Oh, how great he is. How he, he, this, is this is my lay disciple, Chatta Pani or something, I can't remember. Uh, he's a very he's a, endowed with virtue. He's very wise and and humble and so on. Patient, doesn't get angry easily. This kind of thing. And Pasenadi was appeased for the time being. But then later on, Pasenadi saw this lay disciple walking uh, near the palace, and so he had his his guards call him in. And he was walking with his sunshade and sandals on. Immediately he took down his sunshade and took off his sandals and walked and paid respect to the king and stood to one side. And uh, the king gets all sarcastic and says, Oh, so I see you. That, that was nice of you. Why, why, did you, why, did you pay res why did you take off your sun, take down the sunshade and take off your sandals and pay respect to me? He said, well, Because you're the king. And he said, Oh, so today you, you, you realized that, did you? You just realized that today, did you, that I'm the king? 
This guy's an anagami, so there's nothing's going to phase him. He's not like, oh, I'm sorry. He says, no, I always, I always knew that you were the king. And I said, what do you mean? I saw you. The, you didn't even stand up to pay respect to me when you were sitting with the Buddha. And so I explained to him, like an uh, adult would explain to a child, patiently, in the words that he could understand. I was sitting with the Agaraja. You're just a, I can't, couldn't stand up and pay respect to the Padesaraja, the king of the country, and I was sitting with the highest king. And Pasenadi, anyway, there's a point to the story. It's kind of weird how this all fits in here because it doesn't have anything to do with the verse, but the point being that he, 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 he then tries to uh, use this, this, to shame this lay, layman into teaching his queens because he has this idea the Buddha had said that, oh, this is, he's a very wise, uh, wise meditator and wise teacher. So he says, uh, all right, fine, well, to make it up for me, you can, I want you to teach Malika and uh, Vasabha Katya is her name. Wasa, I, I, I'm going to mangle the names. I think it's Wasabakatya, who was this, the daughter of Mahanama, who got us in trouble in the last verse with we, we whatever his name was. Wasabakatya. Huh? Virudaba. You know, there's actually different ways to say his name. We do dubba. Different spellings. But yeah, we do dubba, right? Vidudaba was the son of her, was her son. The, the whole thing, Pasenadi, if you remember, Pasenadi uh, married Malika and Malika, right? Was it Malika? And and then he and then he. What was this? Was one of our recent verses. He, the monks wouldn't stay and eat his food, and he thought, well, if I marry one of the Sakyas, then they'll they'll respect me. They'll think I'm related to the Buddha, so they'll come and stay with me. Which of course was a silly idea. But he did, and he demanded a wife, and they sent him the daughter of a slave who had, Mahanama had fooled around with a slave and, and uh, had, a da had a daughter, and she was quite beautiful. And so they sent her along, and it caused big problems when they found out, and Pasenadi's son killed all the Sakyas as a result. So that's who Vasubhakatiya was. So he said he wanted to teach his two queens. His two queens wanted to learn the Dhamma. They were both quite interested, and so he needed a teacher. And he said, you can come and teach me, teach them. And this layman, he was, he's, he was adamant. He said, no, I can't do that. And he said, what do you mean you can't do that? I'm the king. And he said, look, if I do that, it's very dangerous for a layman to be in the, queen, in the, in the king's harem. Any, any, any rumor that goes around could get could get him in big trouble. It's not appropriate for me to do it. I shouldn't be doing it when it's the, it's the work of a monk. So Basenadi argued with him and, and finally said, fine, then you may go. And then he went to the Buddha and asked the Buddha to send a monk. The Buddha sent Ananda. And Ananda ended up being the teacher of Malika and Vasubhakatiya. So that's the, the background story. Ananda tries to teach the the, the, the story that, that leads up to the verse is Ananda, while he's teaching this, teaching the Dhamma to these two queens and of course all their attendants, he finds that Malika is actually quite quick. She's, she's very um, quick to memorize the teaching, quick to, she's very good at retain, retaining it, keeping it in mind, pondering it. And moreover, she seems inclined to put it into practice. Whereas Vasubhakatiya doesn't remember anything, doesn't pay attention. She's like one of those people, do they say, that keep it in their lap. When, they write, when they're sitting there, they can, they can remember it, but as soon as they stand up, it falls out of their lap. It's like they keep the teachings in their lap, they say. Uh, sort of the, the implication seems to be that she wasn't paying attention. She wasn't really sincerely interested, which is, which is the case. You can't expect everyone to... Not, not everyone responds to the Dhamma the same, responds or appreciates the teaching in the same way. Much of the teaching is uninteresting on the sensual level. It doesn't inspire excitement in the mind. It doesn't, uh, 
some of it is dry and, and, and dull and requires great patience and depth of mind to appreciate. I would say actually the teaching overall is quite inspiring, but you have to be interested in meditation. You have to be able to free your mind from the sort of things that queens are not free from. Uh, queens will often, you would assume, because they just have to sit around and look pretty in those times. It's quite a horrible sort of life to imagine sitting around looking pretty all day. That's, that's your job, like a flower. Uh, hence, hence the verse, you know, when the Buddha comes out with the the, he likens these two queens to flowers. But the point would be that, that it would be very easy to get caught up in the vanity of it and the attachment to sensual, sensual pleasures and sensual uh, desire, beauty and scent and, and so on. And so the Buddha so the Ananda came back every day from from the king's harem to having taught these two queens, and the Buddha asked him one day, "How's it going with the, with the, with the two queens, Malika and Vasubhakatiya? Are they learning the teaching? Are they putting it into practice? Are they are they remembering it? Are they are they respectful? Sakacha is the word. Sakacha is kind of respectful, attentive. Um, are they?" Um, Putting it sincere, are they being sincere about it? And Ananda said, "Well, Malika is very sincere about it, and she's learning it and keeping it in mind, and and seems to be putting it into practice." But uh, Vasubha, but he says, "But your your relative, the the, the daughter of your relative, Nyat Nyati Dita or something like that, the daughter of your relative, your your the Sakyan, Vasubhakatya is." Uh, She's uh, she's not picking it up, and the Buddha then the Buddha gives the verse. He says, "Yes, well, this is the way it is. Not all flowers have beautiful scent, and in the same way, um, not everyone puts the teachings into practice, or uh, or he, you could think of it as kind of an admonishment. But the interesting thing here is." If you look at the background, it was at first I couldn't see how this all fit together for the verse because it's not quite um, it's not quite clear that there was anything to do with practice. Ananda was going to teach them the teaching, but it doesn't say anything about them putting it into practice, uh, and it doesn't certainly doesn't say them anything about them speaking. But there, there's another interesting way of looking at this story. You have actually you have another two people, right? He's talking about the two queens as being. Flowers, and, and, or or you could say, um, speech as being like a flower, and so it's kind of an admonishment to to the for Ananda to give to the two queens, not to just be content with hearing the Dhamma, not to just be content with learning the Dhamma, but should actually put it into practice. It's useless to them. Appala hoti. It's useless. Good speech is useless if you don't put it into practice. But there's another two people, and that's the lay, layman and Ananda. And and this why you can see this is because the the the, the beginning story it talks about how for an enlightened being an anagami they don't even have to um, hear that they don't have, they don't have to say I'm keeping the eight precepts for example which is what the commentary says it says they just keep it naturally they just practice it practice the teachings naturally. So he, 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 and he wasn't teaching it, he wasn't, um, this layman was, was, um, was not, you know, not reciting it, and, and, and who knows, maybe he didn't have so much great knowledge. And he wasn't a monk, but here he was practicing it quite well, practicing it almost to perfection. And then we have Ananda, and you see this occurring more than just in this instance where the Buddha will give these subtle pokes to Ananda. Because Ananda was, was brilliant, right? He was at the top of the class. Uh, photographic memory. And yet here he was sitting at the bottom of the totem pole. He was just a sotapanna. Which is nothing to shake a stick, more than you can shake a stick at it. It's a, 
Sonapan is something quite special. It's it's a great, great thing. And and he praised Ananda on many occasions for his learning and for his wisdom. But uh, it seems to me that a better way of looking at this story is the Buddha taking a chance to remind Ananda and to use even use Ananda as, a, as an example in this case. Anyway, the verse stands on its own. The two verses stand very much on their own and as sort of a epitome of much of what the Buddha reminded his students and which we try to remind Buddhists and remind ourselves in our own practice that it's not good enough for us to have an intellectual appreciation of the teachings. This isn't what the Buddha, the Buddha would want for us. And these kind of verses are, are in this way good to keep in mind and, uh, and recall to mind. They, they have a great power to kick you in the butt and set you in motion, set, a, set us on the path. We realize that um, appreciation of the teachings isn't enough. Even teaching the teachings is certainly not enough. So it's being able to recite the teachings. If you can tell me what the Four Noble Truths are, that isn't what the Buddha wanted for us. And we see this very much in, in cultural Buddhism, where we have Buddhist societies, and it's not just in Asia, but also here in, in North America, where you become Buddhist, and somehow that takes on a meaning for you. Just being Buddhist somehow takes on a meaning for you, as opposed to practicing Buddhism. And I've talked about this before, how it, it doesn't seem right to call yourself a Buddhism for any reason, call yourself a Buddhist for any reason other than the fact that you're practicing the Buddhist teaching. Right? And just like you couldn't call yourself a Marxist unless you were uh, acting according to the teachings of Karl Marx or Groucho Marx, depending. Um, and, 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 and you see this in, I've seen this, I've lived in Thailand, I've been involved with many, in Sri Lanka, with many different cultural Buddhist communities, even here in the West. And you'll see this on all levels of the Buddhist teaching. Morality, for example, once I went to a dinner, a lunch, not dinner, lunch, at, at some lay people's house, I won't say which community, which cultural group it was. Um, they invited the monks to their house, and so we sat down, and I was invited to give the five precepts, because they always like to see the Canadian monk gives the precepts. So I give them the five precepts, everyone took the precepts, and then they fed us. We ate. And right after we ate, we were sitting there, and they took all our food away, and then they brought out food for everyone else. And I sat there, and we were just kind of winding up and getting ready to leave, and then I saw the coolers of beer come out. And they started passing around bottles of beer to everyone. And I thought it had been about a half an hour, half an hour after I gave them the five precepts. This is an extreme example of subhasita, evang subhasita vaja appalahu diyakubato. For one who doesn't put the teachings into practice, they're useless. They're just like a flower that has no smell, has no scent. So taking the five precepts, taking the eight precepts is not the important thing. No. So this we have, that we have. Uh, this is what I scolded everyone about on Vesak, that uh, you can't just take the precepts without having any of any intention of keeping them. Vikala bojana means you have to stay for the whole vikala. Otherwise, it's not really keeping it. And the same goes for, for concentration, you know, there, there are, for meditation, 
it's easy to have an understanding of meditation and to, to know the technique. It's very easy to teach meditation. Teaching meditation and practicing meditation are two very different skills. There was a meditation teacher in our monastery who was still smoking cigarettes, and I, I thought that was quite odd. <laughs> to, to see someone teaching objectivity. But, you know, this is, this is the case. It's, they're two very different skills. Teaching meditation is... It's difficult, but it's difficult, in many ways it's difficult in a different way from actually practicing. So you see this often, people after they finish meditation course they run back, rush back home to try to teach all their friends meditation and end up spending more time trying to convince others to meditate rather than doing the hard work of trying to, convince, trying to cultivate their own meditation practice. Like I think everyone in this room uh, knows about anapanasati, about practicing the four, the four satipatthana, probably all of, most of the people in this room could rattle off the four satipatthana for me. But this is a quite different, quite a different thing from actually being able to practice it. If you look through all of the Buddha's teaching, so much of it is just about how to sit in meditation, how to be objective, how to be here and now. The five khandas, the five aggregates, it does you nothing to know what they are, rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, vijnana until you actually look at them. Um, but I think it's more, I think most pronounced is this, um, this concept of knowing the teaching but not putting it into practice is under the, wisdom, the heading of wisdom. Quite often we'll see Buddhists talking the talk, but not walking the walk. Very erudite scholars teaching Buddhism in university, giving Dhamma talks that are just top-notch, but not practicing themselves. I've given stories about this before. There's the story of Tuchapotila, how he memorized the whole Tipitaka. So he knew everything. And yet he, Buddha still called him empty book. And this monk who was a teacher and all of his students became enlightened. I've, told, I've taught you that one before. And then finally he ran off into the forest and started meditating. And He was such a good teacher that he, when he started crying, the angels started crying. And they said, he said, why are you crying? And the angels said, well, you're such a t good teacher. I thought if you're crying, it must be the way to become enlightened. So they cried along with him. But he was such a good teacher. He knew everything. So th this is a real danger in Buddhism. Because it's, it can be so easily misconstrued as a philosophical teaching or a, an intellectual teaching. And people can very easily get caught up in learning the Buddhist teaching, studying the Buddhist teaching. And lots of crazy things happen when you just focus on the study. I've seen some, this doesn't just go with, um, with, with the, the large populations of Buddhists in Asia. But uh, this man from England, he said he'd read the Tipitaka twice. He told me he'd read the Tipitaka twice in Pali. Read the Tipitaka in Pali twice. And he had some weird ideas. He had this idea that becoming enlightened was uh, you become you can only become enlightened by hearing the Buddha's voice. It's it's by hearing the Buddha's voice that you could you imagine having read the Tipitaka twice. He had this view that there was some magic quality to the Buddha's voice that enlightened people, and that's what the Buddha that's what is Buddhism. Scary stuff. He also thought that uh, just as a side note, we had an argument. Not an argument. It was a friendly argument. He's, a very, he's actually a well-known Buddhist scholar, and was I met him in Bangkok, and we spent an, an evening together. Uh, remember, who was it? Uh, Mahakasapa was going on alms round, and the leper drops a finger in his bowl. Have you heard this story? There's a leper, and his finger falls. He's giving food to, the, to Mahakasapa, and his finger falls off. 
into the bowl of food. And how, how did the conversation start? He said, we were talking about meat eating, I think. And he said, well, you know, arahants, we, we were basically saying that, you know, vegetarianism is not, it's not certainly not spelled out. Obviously, the Buddha didn't uh, require vegetarianism from his, uh, from his students. That was Devadatta. And he said, yeah, I mean, uh, Mahakasa, or no, I think it was we were talking about how hard it would be to be a monk. And he said, I don't think I could ever be a monk, you know, what you have to go through. Like he said, like Mahakasapa, when he had to eat the leper's finger. And I said, what? <laughs> Wait a minute, this isn't the story I remember. And he said, yeah, I remember the finger fell off and it says that he picked it up and ate it. And I said, no, I don't think that's what it says. I think it says he took the finger out and ate the food. And uh, so we, 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 we weren't upset. It wasn't an, an argument or anything. It was just a debate. We were like, he was like, oh, really? And he said, oh. And so I said, wait, wait, let's go back and we'll look at the text. And, uh, you know, I argued. I said, well, you know, because there's a rule against eating human flesh, for one thing. A monk cannot eat human flesh. It's against the rules. And so we went back and looked at the text, and uh, it actually doesn't say. It says the finger fell in, he took it out, he, he, he wasn't, the big thing was he wasn't moved, he wasn't turned off by it, he just took it out and ate it. But, but it's quite clear, you know, it's, it quite clearly could be the case, that and, and should be the case that he took the finger out and ate his food. Yeah, yes. You know, a finger went into his food. He took the finger out and ate it. Yeah. You see? <laughs> That's what it says. So it's actually could be construed either way, which is quite funny. Anyway, a little bit off topic, but an interesting story. He was a nice guy, but uh, certainly didn't have. And we're talking about. I was talking about meditation. I said, "Have you ever tried?" And he said, "No." I, I, I tried to do it, and he's from England, and he said, I tried, and I just, I can't sit still. Which, of course, is the reason why you take up meditation, because you can't sit still. You want to learn. But this is a, this is quite problem, this is a big problem in Sri Lanka, I'd have to say. And I think everyone, we all, we all kind of agree, except this, is that there's a lot of study going on there. Sri Lanka is the number one I think maybe Burma, I'm sure Burma must compete, but from what I've seen, Sri Lankans are very versed and well versed in the Dhamma. It's quite, it's incredible. I was talking to a bus driver about the Dhamma. I remember coming back from Kandy and I have, was sitting in the front seat and he turned to me and we started talking. And I was just asking him about the Dhamma and he's giving me answers and he knows things that I don't about the Dhamma. It was quite surprising. And that wasn't an isolated case. People know the Dhamma there. But there's, not so much meditation. There is, but uh, not to the level that you'd think. You'd think that in a country where 75% of the people, maybe 75% of the 75% of the people, or 50, let's say 50% of the population knows the Dhamma very well, that there'd be a lot more meditation going on. But again, it's a different skill set. It's one thing to appreciate the Dhamma and it's a dangerous thing, actually, to get intoxicated by knowledge. You know what are the Four Noble Truths. And it seems like a simple thing. Four Noble Truths, everyone knows what those are, right? Every Buddhist in Sunday school knows what the Four Noble Truths are, no? Adit, what are the Four Noble Truths? Not to kill. Oh. <laughs> Unlike. <laughs> Want to show your brother up next seat? No. The Four Noble Truths. You don't know the Four Noble Truths. Well, that's okay, because we're not so concerned about that. We're concerned much more about meditation practice. But if I asked any of the adults in the room, everyone would be able to tell me what are the Four Noble Truths. But that doesn't mean you understand the Four Noble Truths. Actually, just those Four Noble Truths is the core of Buddhism. If you can understand those Four Noble Truths, you never have to learn anything else for the rest of your samsaric existence, which would be very short, in fact. It would be very short anyway, because you'd be an arahat. 
understanding the Four Noble Truths is the key to becoming enlightened. And there's just four of them, quite simple. You better learn them. It's not to say that you shouldn't learn or memorize the Buddha's teaching, but you should put them into practice. For example, the, uh, the first Noble Truth is the truth of suffering. So we know that what? Jati, Piduka, birth is suffering, old age is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering, getting what you don't want is suffering, not getting what you want is suffering. Is it? When you get what you want, is it, when you get what you want, is that suffering? When you don't get what you want, is that suffering? When you get what you don't want, is that suffering? <laughs> like, a, like a knuckle sandwich from a monk? I would never do it, you know that. Uh, when you get what you don't want, is that suffering? What's your least favorite food? Do you like liver? <laughs> what if you got liver, would that be suffering? Ah, you see, not getting, getting what you don't want. Or, uh, yeah. We know this. But this isn't the noble, the noble truth of suffering. The noble truth of suffering is the understanding that all things are unsatisfying. The panchupa dhanakanda, the five aggregates. It's understanding that the five aggregates are impermanent suffering and non-self. So it's basically the, the practice of vipassana meditation or the realization that comes from the practice of vipassana meditation. And this sort of gets closer to the point is that often people who practice meditation looking for or thinking about analyzing everything based on the three characteristics as opposed to just experience, as opposed to actually experiencing them. So it's one thing to sit here and, and think, oh, that's impermanent. Yes, that, that ceased, that means it's impermanent and so on. And to say, yes, yes, therefore it's unsatisfying and not, doesn't belong to me. It's quite another thing to sit here and be subject to impermanence, not know what's coming next, which is horrifying. And it's what creates all of our suffering. You don't know what's going to come next. Pain, maybe that pain will come back, that pain that was just there. Maybe it'll suddenly get hot, suddenly get cold. Right, so just a second ago it was enjoyable, maybe I told a joke and it was kind of funny. Now that joke is gone, things have changed. It's insipid and dull. When can I leave? When can you go home? This is where the meditation starts with this stuff. Dealing with impermanence. Dealing with the difficulty of reality. And this is where the learning starts in changing our understanding of reality understanding that reality is stable, satisfying, controllable. And that we can come to a state where we're always going to be at peace and happy. Right? That we can find something and find some way to live our lives in stability. Most adults in the world have a big problem with this. Children don't have such a big problem trying to find stability because they're trying to learn a lot. They're quite unstable. But once you become an adult, you really start to look for stability. Try to find a good job, a family, a house, settle down, find something stable. And so we're all, adults get devastated with, with, by change. and we can, This is where depression comes from. and Stress, anxiety, and so on worrying about the things that we, we love, things that we cling to. So it, it, it's, it, the only thing I want to stress here is that it's important to put the teachings into practice. It's important to differentiate between an intellectual appreciation and ability to rattle off and even explain and talk about the, the Four Noble Truths, the Three Characteristics, um, the Eightfold Noble Path, and to actually put it into practice. 
And most importantly, I would say the three characteristics, because they're the, the most poorly understood and the most practical. They're the front line, they're what you first experience when you sit down and when you watch your stomach, for example. You'll be sitting here watching the stomach rise and fall and wondering where the three characteristics come in, wondering where wisdom comes in. And watching your stomach doesn't seem like a good way to bring about profound realization of the truth. It's kind of like if you ever saw the Karate Kid. You probably didn't. The original, the original Karate Kid. You saw the original with the... With the With the Italian kid? Yeah. Oh. Where he does this? You know the, yeah. What was it? What was this one called? Up, down, I can't remember what he called this one. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. And he thinks it's so stupid. He thought, what am I going to get out of this? This is very similar to the mind state of the meditator and the nature of meditation. The wisdom that comes from meditation is something very... Um, mundane or, or, or very ordinary. It's so ordinary that you, you almost miss it. Or it's, it's so inherent or so close to us that we miss it. But it's what sets us off all the time. When the things that we think of as stable change, someone you love changes or disappears, runs away, dies, gets sick, Something you love breaks, malfunctions, is stolen. If you've ever had something stolen from you, it's a horrible feeling. I just feel like you're like you've, you're violated, like someone violated your body. Right? This was part of me. Having things change. You know, this place, this wonderful monastery, it might burn down. What if it burn, could burn down tomorrow? Then where would we be? You never know what's going to happen in the future. So the meditation is not about thinking about these things. It's about viscerally realizing this, about absolutely everything that we cling to, even our pleasures, our, uh, in, our, mm, our identities, who we are, who we think we are, change. To see that the, the things that we find pleasurable are actually a cause for stress and suffering. They, they, they force us to seek, they, they push us, they impel us to seek. We become drug addicts, we become addicted to our desires. And to see that the things that we, can, we try to control, the things that we identify with, are actually out of our control. People, we try to control our children, we try to control our loved ones, our friends, our And we try to control our lives, we try to control our, our machines. You ever seen someone yelling at their car, like kicking the car? Stupid. You ever see someone hit their computer because it's not working? Or punch a hole in the computer screen because it's not working? Or when you throw your Game Boy down, right? you got a Game Boy and you lose and you throw it down. So we think we can... You know, we, 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 we want to control, we want to be in charge, and we're not, we're not able to deal with not being in control when things are not in our control. It's very difficult. So just watching your stomach is a very good lesson in these three things. When you see that it's changing, all the, changing constantly, never the same. Sometimes it'll be smooth, sometimes it'll be tense, sometimes it'll be long, sometimes it's short. Not under your control, not satisfying, not stable. Just the stomach, you can become enlightened. It's like a pill. My teacher said it's like a medicinal pill. It's got everything in it. You just take one pill, like the matrix. Take the red pill. It's just, just, just one pill. It's very simple. We have many more. Obviously, the four foundations of mindfulness. You should be mindful of pain and happiness and thoughts and emotions as well. But any one of these things, most especially the body, and for that reason the, the stomach, have an incredible power to bring about enlightenment. They, they help you to see things that are so obvious that you almost miss them. You think there's something missing. But if you practice continuously, watch your mind, watch your, your experience, you come to learn such profound things about yourself. Anyway, this, mean, this is what is meant by the second verse, 
kubato, one who puts into practice the words. So the, the important point of this verse is that we should never be content with just knowing the Buddha's teaching, any of it. None of it is for the purpose of knowing and, and sharing with others, it's for the purpose of bringing home to yourself. If you want to spread Buddhism, first you have to spread it to yourself. There's this teacher in Thailand who said this to me, talking about spreading Buddhism. He said, first you have to spread it to yourself. It's very apt, and it's very much how the Buddha would have it. He was never concerned about making teachers. He was, he was about teaching people. You all be students. The most important is to be, to be a student, to learn the teachings. Because someone who has learned the teachings is naturally a teacher, is an example, and is a signpost and is in, so in line with the teachings that they give rise to subhasita, vaj, subhasita, vajja, all the time. Proper speech, good speech, they give rise to the teachings. They declare the teachings in its purity because they practice for themselves. Anyway, so that's the meaning of this verse. And obviously a, a practical teaching of the Buddha is something that we can all keep in mind, something that we should constantly remind ourselves. It's not enough to know meditation. The question is, are we putting it to pra into practice on a daily basis? This is much more important. The Buddha said, a person who knows the teaching but never puts it into practice this is not someone who has lived the holy life, it's still a waste of their holy life. But a person who even for a moment cultivates loving kindness or mindfulness, just for one instant, he says their, their spiritual life is not wasted. So it's not to discourage everyone, or I'm not here to scold everyone, or you're not practicing, it's to encourage us in putting into practice the teachings moment by moment by moment. Even one moment, that's a mahakusala. They say one moment of mindfulness kills off seven lifetimes worth of defilement. Because of the seven javana. <laughs> if you're mindful, those seven javana are neutralized. And those seven javana could give rise to seven births. Just by one moment of mindfulness. But the, and it's accumulative power, the wholesomeness of the mindfulness. This is something that we shouldn't, we shouldn't think of doing when we go to a monastery or, or even just in the morning or in the evening when we do formal meditation. We should be constantly striving to cultivate mindfulness throughout our lives, throughout our days. This is what the Buddha would have of us. This is the emphasis here, clearly stated here and in many, many other places in some of the other Dhammapada verses as well. But we don't want to just be a beautiful flower, being able to spout beautiful words. If they're not put into practice, they're meaningless. And this is the point. You could take the example of the two queens. Ananda, the, with the one queen, he was wasting his breath. They were beautiful words he was teaching, and these are beautiful words that just float in the air like a, um, well, like a beautiful flower. But the Buddha said they're useless like a flower without, because they're useless because they're not being put into practice. Whereas with the other queen, because she was putting in, them into practice, they were like a beautiful flower with a, with a beautiful smell, beautiful scent. It means there was actually something that came of, of the flower. Just there was some, something that came of the teachings, some fruit that came from it. There's another part of it that for a teacher, uh, the, good, the, the good doesn't come from the teaching, the good comes from the practicing. So, I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight. We have a large crowd here and for everyone for tuning in on YouTube. And I'd please take this as a admonishment for all of us not to be content with just learning the teachings, not to be content with just coming and hearing the teachings but that we should put these teachings into practice and give purpose, bring purpose and meaning to our lives, give purpose and meaning to the Buddha's teachings. The purpose and the meaning of the Buddha's teachings isn't in the words 
as beautiful as they might be, it's in our practice of the Buddha's teaching and the Buddha's words, which we should strive to do, strive to cultivate for ourselves, not just intellectually, but practically, morality, concentration, and wisdom. Thank you for tuning in and wishing you all the best on your path.